Masi Cho, thank you to the hosts. Uh, it's been really great coming here, and especially thank you to all of you for uh, sharing your time with, with me and uh, coming to listen to what I have to say. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I was drinking coffee with Gerald Dixon uh, in Burwash Landing in the Yukon, and the topic of self-government came up. Uh, now, Gerald spent much of his life working on Kluwani First Nations land claim and self-government agreements as a researcher uh, and then as a negotiator. So he knows the agreements uh, better than most people. Uh, but he's also one of the agreement's staunchest critics. Uh, and if you spend any time with him, you know uh, uh, right away he's keen to tell people that he voted against ratification uh, and uh, he's happy to tell you why. That day, he sat down with me uh, and he told me a story about uh, something, a conversation he had had with his cousin, uh, a young woman who had just, uh, had just become the uh, elected chief, the new elected chief of Kalani First Nation. He recounted a conversation he had had with her uh, in which he had told her, he had started out by telling her um, that s since he had voted against the agreements, he didn't see why he should be bound by them. Uh, and he said that she had responded to him, well, you have to... Uh, be be you're bound by the agreements because you're a citizen of Kluwani First Nation. Now, at this point in the conversation, he got visibly agitated, and he said to me, I'm not a citizen, I'm an Indian. And he went on and he said that my grandparents, they always told me I was done, an Indian. Now, done is the Southern Toshone equivalent of Dene. He said, I, they always told me I was done, an Indian. They never said anything about me being a citizen of Kluwani First Nation. They said, what does that even mean to be a citizen of Kluwani First Nation? After a moment, he said, no, I think I'd prefer to keep on living as an Indian. Um, now, some people might be tempted to interpret that statement as kind of nostalgia for the Indian Act, a rejection of the uh, land claim agreements, but Gerald's actually a a longtime critic of the Indian Act as well, and he understands it, and, he's, and he doesn't like it. Uh, so there's something else going on. Um, the, the, the fact that he used done and Indian as synonyms uh, suggests that he wasn't referring to the legal definition of Indian under the Indian Act, but rather his idea of what it means culturally to be a Yukon Indian person. And the fact that he contrasted his citizenship in Kluwani First Nation with done the status of being an Indian person culturally, suggests that he sees that there's some um, incompatibility there. Um, citizenship, and, and so that there's uh, presumably an incompatibility between the agreements uh, and indigenous ways of being uh, in the Yukon. Uh, citizenship is not an indigenous concept in the Yukon. Uh, citizenship is a mechanism used by states and some state-like political entities, like First Nations, uh, to formally define their membership, that is, the body of people in whose name they govern. In the absence of a system of territorial states, or in this case, state-like First Nations, citizenship doesn't make any sense as a concept. And indeed, the idea that Yukon Indian people were citizens of specific bounded First Nations, each with jurisdiction over its own distinct territory, would have made little sense to Yukon Indian people uh, uh, until just a few generations ago. As I'll discuss in more detail in my talk tomorrow, modern First Nations are a recent development in the Yukon, and their emergence in that form is closely linked to the legacy of colonialism, uh, colonial rule in Canada. Before that, there were no First Nation citizens uh, because there were no First Nations for them to be citizens of. Yet the Yukon final and self-government agreements are premised on the concept of citizenship, along with a host of other concepts that are also cultural imports. Concepts like jurisdiction, property, um, uh, self-government, nation, to name just a few. Much of my research these days uh, focuses on the incompatibilities between uh, aspects of the uh, final and self-government agreements and cultural, ongoing cultural practices uh, in the Yukon. Uh, it's a big and complicated topic that I could go on for days about, uh, but we have, I have a short amount of time. So I'm going to focus on the concept of citizenship uh, and, and one aspect of citizenship, and that's 
uh, because we're here talking about traditional knowledge, I want to think about the way this concept of citizenship uh, and its imposition through uh, self-government uh, agreements is actually transforming the way First Nation people can relate to one another uh, as well as to the land and animals. So that way of life that we refer to as traditional knowledge. Again, I'm going to refer mostly to the Kluwani First Nation, uh, but what I say I think has relevance uh, across the North uh, where there are agreements that are of si similar in structure. So in a nutshell, the issue is this. Non-humans are not eligible to be Kluwani First Nation citizens. Only humans, not moose, not caribou, not spruce trees, can be citizens of Kluwani First Nation. Now that's not really surprising. The same can be said of citizenship anywhere in the world. Uh, in fact, the restriction to humans is so basic an aspect of citizenship that no citizenship code in the world, at least that I've looked at, uh, bothers to state it explicitly. They never say you have to be a, a human, right? It's just implied. Um, yet the exclusion of non-humans from citizenship uh, reflects a fundal, fundamental, if implicit, assumption of Euro-American liberal political theory. Only human persons can be political subjects. Animals, plants, and other non-human entities may be the objects of politics. We can fight over them, uh, but they can't be subjects, political subjects th themselves. Although the exclusion of non-humans from the political realm is generally taken at gra for granted among uh, Euro-American political theorists and constitution makers, it represents a radical departure from Yukon Indian ways of being in the world. Indigenous social relations in the Yukon were, and in many cases still are, predicated uh, or ordered by principles of kinship and reciprocity that cross-cut the territorial boundaries of modern, uh, today's modern uh, First Nations. And these relations were and are not restricted to human persons. Uh, in fact, animals and other non-human persons uh, are regarded as powerful actors who play a vital political role in Yukon Indian uh, indigenous society. Although there were no standalone political institutions per se in indigenous times, non-humans were clearly active in the political realm. In fact, Yukon Indian people regarded themselves as among the least powerful persons uh, on the landscape. They recognized their indebtedness to and dependence upon a powerful other than human persons uh, who made, it was these other than human persons, these animal persons, that made the rules and laws uh, and enforced them uh, that governed all aspects of human and non-human life, including everything from how to hunt, how to interact with animals, uh, how to treat the remains, how and who could eat what parts of an animal, um, and so on. Uh, also governed things like potlatch practices at potlatches, how people interact with one another, uh, the, 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 the need to share meat that one captures. These were all laws that were handed down by animals uh, to people. These powerful non-human actors, uh, mostly animal but not only animal actors, punished transgressions of these laws, sometimes quite harshly, by visiting misfortune, sickness, even death on those who transgressed the, lo the laws. These laws were passed down from one human uh, generation to the next uh, through stories. Uh, people in the Yukon often say uh, they're kind of, this is what happened a long time ago. Um, these stories about when the, the earth came, uh, the world came into being, how animals took their current form and so on, uh, and they, they passed these rules down. And these stories contain the laws, and they've been passed down from generation to generation uh, as these stories. Um, despite the ancient origin of these laws, animals continue to enforce them. They also continue to communicate with human people by speaking to them in dreams, visions, and the occasional waking encounter. Also importantly, animals play an ongoing role in the political education of First Nation people by cultivating, cultivating in them attitudes and interpersonal skills that they'll need if they're to assume their roles as fully competent adult members of a society that includes both humans and, and animal people. Despite the dramatic changes that have taken place in the Yukon over the past hundred years, many Yukon Indian people, uh, like other hunting peoples across the, the North, uh, continue to act in accordance with the laws received from these animal other than human persons upon whom they depend. Because it draws a firm line between human and non-human, the human and non-human residents of Kluwani First Nation territory, First Nation citizenship is fundamentally incompatible with this stance toward the non-human world. In fact, KFN citizenship is an integral part of a system of governance that precludes non-human participation in the, human, in the political realm. 
as a politico-territorial uh, organization modeled on the liberal democratic state, uh, Kiwani First Nation is conceived of by all as of and for the, peop the human people of Kiwani First Nation. The non-human residents of KFN's territory are excluded from this notion of popular sovereignty, and the government of KFN is neither of nor for them. Uh, instead, the agreements treat them as a set of resources, and they divide up the ownership and jurisdiction of those resources among the three signatory governments. Under its final agreement, for example, uh, KFN retains ownership and jurisdiction over its settlement lands. This includes the power to enact laws regarding, quote, the use, management, administration, and protection of natural resources under the ownership, control, or jurisdiction of Kiwani First Nation. That's right from the agreement. While advocates of First Nation rights might applaud such a formulation, it is utterly foreign to pre-contact Kluwani thought and practice, and it's largely incompatible with many ongoing uh, Kluwani practices. The notion that Kluwani people have jurisdiction and control over the non-human residents of Kluwani territory, and that it's therefore KFN's job to manage and administer them in the best interests of its human citizens, stands in stark contrast to ongoing practices, knowledge, and values that are based on the assumption that these other than human persons are powerful actors, political actors in their own right. Although these beings are enmeshed in a complex web of social relations with human persons, they are neither subject to human law, nor do they respect human assertions of territoriality, jurisdictional or otherwise. And that's something that caribou biologists would certainly agree with. Um, Anishinaabe legal scholar John Burroughs is one of the very few people uh, that I've come across who addresses uh, explicitly, or, uh, scholars anyway, that uh, addresses this exclusion of non-humans inherent in Euro-American conceptions of citizenship. And he says it's, he criticizes the concept of citizenship, and in his case, he's looking at First Nation citizenship, uh, because it's, quote, not consistent with the holistic notions of citizenship that must include the land and all beings upon it, end quote. What he tries to do is develop a new concept that he refers to as landed citizenship, which is more encompassing, more holistic, which takes into account non-humans. And I'll read what he has to say about this. He says, quote, Our births, lives, and deaths on this site have brought us into citizenship with the land. We participate in its renewal, have responsibilities for its continuation, and grieve for its losses. As citizens of this land, we also feel the presence of our ancestors and strive with them to have the relations of our polity respected. Our loyalties, allegiance, and affection are related to the land. The water, the wind, the sun, and stars are all part of this federation. The fish, birds, plants, and animals also share this union. Our teachings and stories form the constitution of this relationship and direct and nourish the obligations it requires." End quote. Despite some important cultural variations between Anishinaabe and Northern Athabascan culture, I think Borrow's perspective, his vision here, would strike a chord with many Yukon Indian people who continue to think of themselves as part of the land, part of the water. And that's a quote from an elder. It's also the title of a well-known book on uh, uh, the history of Yukon Indian people. Yet Borrow's effort to indigenize citizenship raises many theoretical and practical questions. First Nation citizenship is, after all, a legally defined term, and it's formally defined uh, in Yukon First Nation uh, self-government agreements and constitutions. Uh, and it's also enacted daily by First Nation citizens, uh, First Nation people, when they participate in political debate, uh, when they vote in First Nation elections, uh, when they participate or attend general assemblies and make laws, uh, when they are appointed to and sit on co-management boards on behalf of their First Nation, um, when they avail themselves of First Nation uh, programs and services. It's one thing to assert, as John Burroughs does, uh, that the abstract concept of citizenship, of Kalani First Nation citizenship, should be expanded to include moose uh, and caribou and spruce trees. Uh, but it's quite another to suggest that these same beings should be eligible to vote, uh, in KFN elections, to sit on co-management boards, and to participate in processes of First Nation governance. But this is an important part of what First Nation citizenship entails. Um, citizenship is more than just a sense of uh, shared community and interdependence. It also signals membership in a state or a state-like political organization. And it implies a particular relationship that entails both obligations and benefits between individual citizens and the state to which they belong. 
Fulfilling these obligations and receiving these benefits are an integral part of what it means to be a citizen. So how exactly are moose, spruce trees, and other non-human persons supposed to assume their proper roles as individual citizens vis-a-vis -vis the Kluwani First Nation state? Burroughs does not say. Um, the problem, I would suggest, lies in the status the implications of the citizenship concept. Animals and non-human persons were indeed full political subjects in indigenous Yukon and Anishinaabe society, but they no more derived that status from their membership in some territorially ordered indigenous polity than did Yukon Indian people themselves. Rather, their political role emerged through their participation in ongoing relations of kinship and reciprocity uh, with the various kinds of persons with whom they came into contact. Flexible though it is, the concept of citizenship is simply unable to accommodate this view of the world. This isn't to reject Borrow's vision of political relations among human, land, and animals. On the contrary, it's merely to suggest that citizenship is not a flexible enough term uh, to do the job. If the citizenship concept isn't flexible enough to accommodate Yukon First Nation people's ideas about proper relations between humans, animals, and the land, and one another, uh, then what are the consequences of imposing the category of citizenship upon them through the land claim and self-government agreements? In particular, what are the consequences for that way of being and relating to the world that we call traditional knowledge? In their capacity as citizens, Kluwani people are privileged residents of their territory because collectively they assert exclusive jurisdiction and control over the management of animals, plants, and other non-human persons on their settlement land. None of the non-human residents in the region have such rights or obligations under the new agreements. Thus, Kluwani citizens stand apart from and above the non-human inhabitants of their territory. As citizens, Kluwani people can be good and responsible stewards of their land, but they cannot be part of the land, part of the water. And it's this, among other things, uh, that I think makes people like Gerald Dixon uh, profoundly uncomfortable with his status as Kluwani First Nations citizen. It's perhaps too early to say uh, exactly how this change in perspective will affect human-animal relations, to say nothing of human-human relations, uh, but there can't be much doubt, I don't think, that people who see their role as being one of managing animal populations uh, in their jurisdiction are bound to relate to animals differently than those who view them as powerful, intelligent persons with whom they have to learn to live. Thank you. <laughs>